from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. It is such a pleasure to finally meet Jane Smiley because I've been chasing after her for years. I taught at the prep school in St. Louis that still brags about her attendance. Like all of you, I read and loved A Thousand Acres, her Pulitzer Prize winning novel. Then when I got to the post, I had the honor of sending her novels to review for us, which is one of the reasons I admire her so much. She's one of the few really successful novelists who's willing to stay fully engaged in the critical conversation, and not just by blurbing her friends' books, but by taking literary criticism seriously. Her 1996 essay for Harper's Magazine about Huck Finn and Uncle Tom's Cabin remains one of the classics of the genre, and she continues to publish insightful book reviews for us and other publications. Meanwhile, Smiley's popular and critically acclaimed novels take us into the comedy and the tragedy of the world around us, from farming to academics, from real estate to Hollywood, and young people are discovering this talented author for themselves in her young adult novels now. Winner of the Penn USA Lifetime Achievement Award for Literature in 2006, Jane Smiley is one of the brightest stars in the constellation of a modern American literature. Please join me in welcoming her. Well, that was a wonderful introduction, and I should tell you that um, when the Huck Finn article came out, it was not greeted as a piece of great literary criticism. Um, Harper's told me that they received more hate mail than they had in 150 years. I thought that was really an honor. Um, I, I have to thank you all for staying this long. Um, I'm not sure I would have uh, stayed for even Leo Tolstoy at this point of this day. <clears throat> but it reminds me of a story that they told me yesterday at the Naval Observatory. Um, this book, Private Life, contains uh, two characters that were part of my family, and um, the woman is based on uh, my great aunt, and the man, on Andrew, is based on her crackpot scientist husband. And um, he is still a presence on the internet. And when uh, you type in his name, about half the stuff that comes up says, <clears throat> He's right, he was always right, he will be vindicated, and the machine that I built in accordance with his principles was taken away from me at U.S. Customs and is now being used by the CIA as a surveillance machine. Um, so yesterday, I, he worked at the Naval Observatory, so yesterday I was over there, and they told me the following story. When he was in, my aunt died in the early 50s, and, and in sometime in the mid-50s, he decided it was time for him to get his Nobel Prize. So he went to Stockholm to, to claim it. <laughs> and um, and the, the university there was very kind to him, and an astronomer there, who, who did know who he was, set up a thing where he could talk to a group like this. And um, he did give this talk. But unfortunately, he seemed not to be able to get that to, to get that, extract that Nobel Prize from them. And so um, he decided to go back again. So two years later, he went back again. And, the, uh, and the, the astronomer, you know, a man whose kindness is probably legendary, uh, couldn't get any of his fellow astronomers to come and listen to uh, this guy give the talk anymore. And so he rounded up all of the janitorial staff in the <laughs> university. And he had them sat, sit through the talk. And so I hope this is not the janitorial. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm going to read, do something I haven't done before with this book, which is to read from toward the end. Um, for me, this is a reasonably well-plotted book. Um, uh, you may have read 10 Days in the Hills, a, a third of which is graphic sex. And, there is no sex in here. So once you leave out the sex, you have to introduce the plot, <laughs> or a plot. And um, so at the beginning of part five, there are five parts. And at the beginning of part five, Margaret feels that she has come to um, understand her husband and to be able to manage him. 
you know, fatal mistake, as you ladies must know. And um, she's now she's now about 55. He is in his late 60s. He seems to have given up his desire to to do Mortal Kombat with Albert Einstein. Um, he seems to have done that, and to take up other interests. And so um, I am going to uh, read a little bit about what happens then. This is, you have to imagine this takes place in December of 1937. One day, Margaret came home from a morning visit to Mrs. Wareham to find newspapers laid out on the dining room table. The Examiner and the Chronicle, the Vallejo paper, and the Sacramento Bee. Andrew was proceeding around the table reading every word about an unfortunate incident outside of Nanking. The incident looked quite straightforward to Margaret. The Japanese army had taken Nanking, which Chiang Kai-shek had then had to abandon. In the course of this, Japanese planes sank an American boat because the pilots didn't see American flags. Though lots of men were wounded, only three were killed, and most of the sailors were rescued by nearby British boats. Roosevelt complained, and some admiral apologized. By the next day, the Japanese had offered to pay for the sinking of the boat, and the foreign minister himself apologized. Andrew decided to go over to the island, he hadn't been there in months, and hear what they were saying in the officer's club and anywhere else he could manage to eavesdrop or to get someone into conversation. He was a light with investigative purpose. Margaret was glad to get him out of the house. At the end of the week, he even put in a call to their friend Pete. Andrew wasn't the only person interested, of course, the ladies in Margaret's knitting group had talked about the incident for an hour. When he hung up, she reported what they had all agreed upon. But Andrew, when most governments make a mistake like that, they cover it up for weeks and then go on for more weeks, insisting that there was provocation and then wait to be sued for years after that. I think this incident speaks well of the Japanese. Perhaps it does, but it's a mystery. The sailors on the boat said that the flags were completely visible. Well, in any way, it, it seems outside your usual area. It is an interesting event in and of itself. He paused. And I have been feeling of late that I've let the world get away from me. What did I come across the other? Oh, yes, my bird list from so long ago. Remember how we walked about the island and looked at gulls and hawks? I realized that I haven't always been a dull boy. She thought, ah, what harm can come from his getting out of the house and diverting himself with this? So she said, it's worth looking into then. She said reassuring things like this all the time now, while she was going about her own business, passing in and out of the rooms he was in on her way to the shop, or to weed, or to visit someone, or to go knitting, or to work with the aid society she would collected for. Though her happiness had taken a little while to set in, she traced it directly to this house Andrew had purchased. It was, a, it was pleasant to wake up in, convenient to all of Vallejo, and quite suitable for hosting her share of knitting circles and get-togethers. After a few days, she quietly put the newspapers away and, in fact, forgot the whole thing until she ran into Mrs. Kimura around Christmas. They talked about Naoko, Mrs. Kimura's daughter. Margaret asked after Mr. Kimura, and Mrs. Kimura asked after the captain. When Mrs. Kimura declared that she had just heard from her son Joe that morning, Joe had moved to Japan as a dentist, thinking there would be more opportunity there, but in the three years since going, had never made up his mind whether to stay in Japan or to come home. Lester could not make up his mind, that was the other son. Is that us? Do you hear that? <laughs> Lester? 
there something we can do here? Okay. Lester could, his, uh, Lester could not make up his mind whether to join his brother or to continue working for the Pacific Trading Company. Mrs. Kimura, Naoko, Cassandra, Mrs. Wareham, and Margaret had been over the pros and cons of all the choices. It was one of their standard topics of conversation. Now, Mrs. Kimura reported that Joe and two of his friends were planning to go to the U.S. Embassy in Tokyo before Christmas to leave off a letter of sympathy and also a monetary contribution toward the medical and dental needs of those wounded aboard the boat in China. Margaret exclaimed, that's very kind. <coughs> Mrs. Kimura said, many have done same thing, wealthy businessmen down to simple schoolgirls. America ambassador wife doesn't have a moment to herself from receiving wives of high families. I admit, Joe, not think of this, but two friend ask him. Even so, they agree to donate two weeks from their employment to this. She gave Margaret a happy smile. And Joe says he found bride from good family, 26 year old. She has business sewing Western style dress for wealthy Japanese wives. Two weeks pay though. To me, I see because of this that Japanese people will prevail over the warriors of the army. Emperor is being pulled into. He knows that Japanese people don't like war in China, but the army foils their wishes every time. Two week pay for this is how much Japanese people want to live in peace. Later, Margaret wished she had not mentioned this encounter at supper. Andrew was skeptical and Margaret was rather sharp when she said, they have been forthcoming, very forthcoming. Well, my dear, there is literally always more to everything than meets the eye. The eye is a very poor instrument for seeing anything. Over on the island, they are very, very suspicious. Of what, though? Her voice was rising. She inhaled deeply. What did it matter, really? really? She adopted a neutral expression. It helped of some sleight of hand. The orange will be pulled out from behind the ear, big as life. And how did it get there when the magician was wearing short sleeves? She laughed. It wasn't very often that Andrew made her laugh, and he gave her a gratified smile. And then the incident of the boat, the panne, was resolved, and the papers completely stopped talking about it. Space. Andrew has been talking about cosmology practically their entire wedding, I mean their entire marriage. But he seems to have given that up. Um, so it, it goes on. Without the universe, the big house was too small for him. The steep steps too shallow, the high ceilings too low, the spacious rooms only a stride or two long. Whatever she was doing, knitting or reading or cleaning or cooking, there was the constant drum of footsteps, boot steps really. So she was happy when he went out, dressed nicely, always in a suit and well-shined shoes. He carried a walking stick and wore a hat to keep off the sun. He walked fast and he was healthy for a man of his age. He would never be mistaken for a bum or a ne'er-do-well, she thought. It was Officer Napolitano and Officer Kelly who stopped by one day and told her that once in a while he would flag someone down driving a car. Once in a greater while that person would stop, no doubt thinking that Andrew was an old man in distress. Andrew would open the passenger door and get in, telling the driver, almost always a woman, to drive him over the causeway to the island or perhaps somewhere downtown. One poor girl took him about for an hour and a half while he did various errands. The girl thought he was lost and didn't want to abandon him. The girl didn't even know what the penne was. She thought he was saying Panama. Margaret said, I thought he had forgotten about the penne, but, but is he in some sort of da danger or is he a danger to others stepping into the street suddenly? Is that the problem? 
Ma'am, it is that he is relentless in engaging people in conversation. He won't let them turn away or refuse to answer. And when they do answer, he hooks his finger into their buttonholes and won't let them get away. When they complain to us, then they complain to us, personally, ma'am, I'm afraid someone is going to pop him in the nose one day. Are his opinions that controversial? He said, oh, no, ma'am, it's not that. Here's an example. He flagged down officers Lugano and Moore, who brought him here the other day. You were out, ma'am. He sat in the car with one foot in the street and the door open for 45 minutes before they could get rid of him. Margaret chuckled and said, they should have taken him to jail. Would that frighten him, ma'am? Officer Napolitano looked very earnest and young. She guessed he was about 25 or 26. She shook her head, her tone still light. From what you say, he would just engage everyone at the station in conversation and ask for rides here and there. I don't doubt that, ma'am, but do these young women seem to feel threatened in any way? Oh, no, ma'am, not in the usual way. They seem to feel that it is rather like being with an elderly eccentric relative, but Captain Early has old-fashioned courtly manners. All of the young ladies say that, ma'am. But one young woman had a job to get to, and he made her two hours late. Oh, dear. They were smiling, but making it clear that this could not go on. She said, Officer, I do apologize, but my husband is frustrated in his work. Oh, we know that, ma'am. We know that Albert Einstein has balked him at every turn and now comes to Vallejo to spy on him. <laughs> Actual alarm displaced the confusion she had been feeling. Einstein? Oh, yes, ma'am. He told officers Lugano and Moore that he saw Einstein on Capitol Street. He thought maybe Einstein had come to Vallejo to see him, but he wasn't able to make himself known to Einstein on that particular occasion. They all three sighed at the same time. Finally, she said, I see what you mean, Officer Kelly. I'll talk to him. But first, she called on Mrs. Wareham at the hotel. The Warrington was a good business and a respected establishment. Over the years, with her multitude of boarders and guests, many or most of whom were men, Margaret suspected Mrs. Wareham had seen a great many things. Andrew, as it turned out, came in there every day and had a cup of coffee. Mrs. Wareham said, Margaret, I thought you knew you were sending him to me. He's here promptly at 9.30, he gives me your best greetings, and he drinks a cup of coffee with a lump of sugar and reads his paper. He stays about an hour and then says goodbye and goes out, rain or shine, really. But haven't you heard about his activities? Not at all. She told her friend what the police told her, then said, does he talk all the time and make people discuss the war in China? He never says a word about anything. He just nurses his cup of coffee and then pays and goes. He always leaves the girl a nice tip, too. But what should I do? Well, Margaret, first you must inform him in no uncertain terms what, that these girls aren't sailors and he can't be commandeering their services as he once did those young men. They all did that. It was part of being a captain. Well, that's true. I should have remembered that. And you must say that it looks very strange to the police. That will catch his attention. You and I know Captain Early. He is the most reticent of men, but he is very large also. The thought made her nervous. Mrs. Wareham leaned toward her and said, I see you're shaking your head as you always do. Margaret hadn't realized that she was shaking her head. She made herself sit still. For once in your life, Margaret, you must take charge of the situation. Take charge of him. I have to say, in spite of her best efforts, Margaret must have continued to look dismayed. I mean this kindly, dear. You are who you are. Who is that? Who is that? Margaret found herself saying. There was a long pause. Then Mrs. Wareham looked a little embarrassed. She said, Everyone knows you're a good woman, Margaret. Everyone knows that. It sounded like an insult, but it had the desired effect. That evening, she cooked Andrew's favorite supper dish and also made a pie, since there was some nice rhubarb in the market. 
Not quite sure how to broach her subject, she hemmed and hawed about the weather, but finally she said, Andrew, I understand you have met Officer Lugano and Moore of the Vallejo Police Department. Indeed, I have. They were most interested in my investigation. I didn't know you were pursuing investigations, Andrew. Well, of course I am. Into the Panay incident. Surely you haven't forgotten that. His tone was affable. You mean that boat that was sunk in China? The reparations were paid. He took a last bite of liver, set down his fork, and carefully wiped his mustache with his napkin. He shook his head. Yes, they were. A clever gambit and cheap in the long run. Do you think so? Mrs. Kimura told me how generous the Japanese people have been. Yes, yes, no denying that, but my dear, I am now free to tell you that I have solved the mystery. You have? Well, yes, I have. And I have informed the Vallejo police of my views, and I have sent letters to the commandant of the base, to the secretary of state, and, of course, to the New York Times. I mailed them yesterday. I feel that I can talk more freely about this, even to you, having committed my ideas to paper. And certainly I hope, although I have no assurance, that the Times will publish my conclusions. I believe that we would all be safer in the end if they were to do so. And then they talk a little bit about the Penn A Institute and I'm, incident, and I'm not going to tell you about that. Um, and then he, she, she listens to everything he has to, to, to say. She's a little disturbed. And, <clears throat> and then he says, then she says, perhaps in order to change the subject, she said, and the police also told me you've seen Einstein. Oh, yes, indeed, twice now. He seemed happy to talk about it. He is surprisingly short. He wears glasses and his suit was rumpled, but of good twill. He coughed and went on. He does wear nice shoes. His feet are small. Look to me like he has his shoes made in England. And his hair isn't as wild as it looks in pictures. She said, you noticed his shoes? Were you staring at him? I am a naturally observant person. I've never seen him in glasses in the newspaper. That surprised me, too. He looks older than he is. He must be 60. Looks 70 if a day. Maybe it wasn't Einstein. Maybe, indeed, she ventured. Why do you think he's here? I had thought the first time that he was here to see me. And I was prepared to extend the olive branch, I must say, but I'm more suspicious now. I'm glad I did not reveal myself to him the first time as I had thought to do. She got up without saying anything and began to clear the dishes from the table. How to proceed was a mystery to her. He was evidently delusional about both the Japanese and Einstein, but also she thought harmless. She took the dishes to the kitchen and set them beside the sink. When she came back into the dining room, fortifying herself with thoughts of Mrs. Wareham's very earnest instructions, she sat down, not across from Andrew, but beside him, and she put her hand on his knee. She leaned forward and said, Andrew, I am sure that those whom you contacted will read your letters with utmost interest and respect, and I hope that when you've concluded, what you've concluded shows them what they must do. But at the same time, the policeman here today told me that you have been waving down automobiles and then getting in and telling the drivers that they must take you here and there. Young people don't mind. Maybe not. But if these young people are young girls, I am absolutely certain that their parents would object to you, what was the phrase here, diverting them from their regular business. If you want to get around, you have to use the streetcar or I will drive you myself. My dear, what I need to do is not always systematic or well organized. I am led here and there by my investigations. But your investigations seem to be over, in, in part. The police, the police made it clear to me. Here she caught his gaze and held it. You must not impose yourself upon any women. You must not. 
Doing so after the police have asked you to stop could seriously compromise your reputation in Vallejo and on the island. He looked genuinely startled and said, I hadn't thought of that. I was only, yes, Andrew, I am sure you were only thinking of the next step in your investigation, but it looks different to others. Pe people know I'm enthusiastic. They do, but not everyone knows you in town the way they did on the island. This he seemed to accept. Thank you. Um, I like the questions part, so jump up, run to the microphones. Um, I'll answer questions about any book um, and um, most anything else. So, um, most anything else. Yes. Um, I, I wanted to tell you how very much I enjoyed your book, A Thousand Acres. Mm -hmm. I was really inspired, especially by the, the the writing style and the first person narrative, which I really love. And um, <clears throat> it was because of uh, that inspiration that I decided to draw my own hand at writing a novel. Oh, really? And it's because of my research, I wrote a novel about George Gershwin, I discovered that you were born on his birthday. I was, tomorrow. Yes, tomorrow. So I'd like to <laughs> wish you a happy- T.S. Eliot has joined us also. Oh, okay, okay. Anyway, um, uh, I was wondering, I, I, sometimes it seems as if really people who are well established as writers like you are uh, really wouldn't know an answer to this question, but I'm going to ask it anyway. What should a person do who believes they have written a really good novel but they just can't find an agent and they've tried very hard? I don't know. <laughs> um, one of the problems is that um, if you're starting out and you're in, a, in, you're in a school or a program, then um, it's easier to network and get connected to somebody like that. Um, and so one of the things I always advise writers of, no, of whatever age is don't hesitate to join a program, don't hesitate to join a writing group, don't hesitate to join a book group. Networking is really important. and um, and. You know, in the old days, and I mean the real old days before me, you really had to go somewhere like um, New York to get connected. <laughs> but that's not true anymore. There are, universities have programs, universities have summer programs, people teach in those programs. What you really want to do is for someone to read your manuscript or part of it and say, oh, this, this is interesting, I'm gonna show it to my friend so-and-so and, and to me, that's probably a better way. But my caveat is, we don't know what publishing is going to be like, even in two years. And so maybe the better way is to publish it yourself online. Mm -hmm. I have a friend who has a website, and he started publishing his novel on his website, you know, say, a 1,000 or 2,000 words at a time. And pretty soon, he had quite a few readers. And um, so, so in some ways, your question is less answerable today than it was 10 years ago. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm sorry I can't be more help. Mm -hmm. Yes. I just wanted to thank you for writing Duplicate Keys. Oh, thanks. I'm a librarian, and um, I have been reading that book on and off for about 10 years. Really? So, um, and I'm just That's always fine. one of the obscure ones. I'm glad you like it. I just love it, and, and I had no idea that you were going to be here until yesterday when I got to my parents' house and opened the program, and I thought, oh my gosh, I should have brought my copy of Duplicate Keys. Duplicate Keys so. is a murder mystery that I wrote. It was about my third novel, and it takes place in Manhattan, and my boyfriend for a while before that time was an aspiring uh, singer-songwriter. And after we broke up, I split myself into two girls, um, one of whom was a sap and one of whom was really mad. And I split him into two guys, one of whom was pretty nice and one of whom was pretty nasty. And then 
my, my mad self killed both of his selves. <laughs> but then he, re then he came back into my life and we got married and fathered a son who's very nice. And so, <laughs> so we actually live, get along great now, so. You never know, you never know. Yes? In regard to your earlier comment, can you put too much sex into a book? Depends on who the reader is. If, if the reader is a member of your family, absolutely yes. <laughs> um, no member of my family has admitted to reading that book. Has admitted to getting past page five. Wow. And, um, but you know, I wouldn't have read it either if, I, if my relative had written it. Uh, so, I, you know, I, I did that for several reasons. And actually, 10 Days in the Hills is one of my favorite books. And the official reason is that it was based on the Decameron. Boccaccio you, had a lot of, someone calling me? Oh, Boccaccio had a lot of um, sex in the Decameron, which was um, written in about uh, 1350. And it was also based in Hollywood. But it was also something that I, as a writer and as a woman, wanted to try. And I wanted to try a new thing with the sex, which was I wanted the reader reading the book to come to the sex and pause and think the usual pornographic thought, and then think, no, I want to see what happens and turn the page. So that was my challenge. I wanted the reader to keep reading no matter how hot the sex got. Cool. And it was a lot of fun for me, but I think it was an iffy aspect of the book from many readers' point of view. Thank you. I'm delighted you're in Washington. Thank I, you. Um, whenever your name comes up with friends who love to read, I mention your initial book of short stories. Mm. I loved your short stories. I love the way you talk about Midwestern weather. And driving through it, I loved Kirby. All those, um, oh, and, and and yeah, and also your description of children. You have a way of seeing into their darker <laughs> side. Well, I really, I I wrote about my children very tentatively when I was when they were my children, but my favorite thing that I ever wrote about any of the kids had to do with um, a, a sleepover where some kids came over, and I think they were all seven or eight, maybe. And um, one of them woke up and wanted to be read to sleep. And my husband uh, was up. He was always up late at night. And he said, well, what should I read you? And she said, TV guide. <laughs> and so he sat down next to where she was sleeping. And she laid back. And he read aloud from the TV guide. And I thought, I got to put this in a story. Well, I, I did not refer, I'm sorry if it sounded like, to your, to your children, but the children that you create such in-depth oh, personalities you. in those short stories. It's, thank you. It's, I thought they, I saw a real gift there. Thanks. Thank you. Um, hi. Hi. Um, I was wondering what you thought about something. I hadn't known you were a book critic, which is fantastic because you're also such a Well, I'm a reviewer. I don't consider myself a critic. Well, I consider myself a reviewer, yeah. Well, recently, with the release of Jonathan Franzen's novel, Freedom, there's been a... Is he I know, around? I, I doubt it. Um, there's been kind of a renewed kerfuffle about the way in which women's literary fiction is treated yeah. differently than, than men's literary fiction. And since you've been a, a, a writer for so long and a book critic, I wondered if you felt that that was maybe just an artificial distinction now, or if that was still a cha challenge for serious female uh, writers. Um, it's not the most important challenge, so go for it. Oh, I wasn't worried about it okay. on a personal <laughs> level. Uh, All right. The, um, here's the main thing I know about this is that um, a few years ago when the New York Times did a survey of authors, critics, scholars about the best book of the last 25 years, <clears throat> I, I was asked along with Michael Cunningham and a couple of, and a scholar and a critic and maybe one other person to blog about the results. The results were Toni Morrison was number one. It was all men until number 11, and that was um, um, 
home, what's her name, Marilyn, Marilyn, Marilyn Robinson. Robinson. Women, very few women. So I called Greg Cowles and I said, okay, Greg, tell me about the process of picking this. And he said, well, we sent out 300 requests to prominent literary types. I said, okay, how many came back? He said, mm, from the men, almost all of them came back. From the women, no. So 70% of everything that came back, 69% was from men, 31% was from women. I said, how did they choose? How, or how did they vote? He said, all the men voted for men, the women voted for half women, half men. And I thought that was really revealing because to me what the women were saying by not voting was this is a meaningless exercise. That um, there is no such thing in the world of literature as the greatest. I mean, are you going to say, if you, if you have, the I'll, I'm going to pick three books I really love. The Good Soldier, um, Anna Karenina, Emma, and then a fourth modern one, The War of the End of the World by Mario Vargas Llosa. These books are not comparable. You cannot say one is greater than the other. You could say one is fuller or one is more perfect, but they, those characteristics aren't going to apply uniformly to these books. So that's why I thought maybe the women didn't participate. But the other thing I thought was, OK, girls, if you want to be considered great, you have to step up to the plate and play the game. Because the game isn't going away, you know? I sent mine in. I think I must have picked Beloved, you know? But as I said in my blog, or my part of the blog, I'm going to learn now from Philip Roth. I'm going to pick me next time. <laughs> it's, it's not second grade anymore. You know, you can vote for yourself. So, um, so anyway, that's one of the things I learned. Concerning Jonathan Franzen's book, you know, I think this is a glancing blow that oh, happened well, to I, land on him. I don't think it had anything to do with him. I no, I don't think so. Sparked it. But so. it's a good thing to talk about, and and um, plenty of people are happy to talk about it. So. Thank you. Sure. Hi there. Uh, so when you're working on a book, uh, how do you decide when to stop? When how do you decide when? Okay, this book is finished. It really varies from book to book. Um, this book went through a lot of drafts, and um, I decided that we were in the last draft when I showed it to my bookkeeper's book group. And, um, and they had maybe 10 extremely specific things that they thought were missing or needed to be fixed. And I fixed them. And um, I, I fixed them in the way, actually, that they had hoped I would fix them. And then I decided it was finished. Um, Thousand Acres, I just went until I was exhausted. I said, I can go no more. And I decided it was finished then. Um, but the Greenlanders, I decided it was finished when I got to the last line. You know, there was, there's something about books that um, seem to be, some books, seem to be given to you from outside. And um, they just come in a rush. Can you imagine that book came in a rush? But they come in a rush, and they have a kind of energetic integrity to themselves. And you know you can fiddle, and you know you can fix this and fix that, but um, it is of a piece. It came to you of a piece, and that, there you go. So for me, it's always, um, uh, it's always something different. I don't like to write too many drafts because I get really confused about what's in and what's not in various drafts. So three is, three is optimum for me, two or three. Anyone else? Here's one. Here's one now. I'm wondering uh, what contemporary authors you like to read, novelists? What contemporary novelists I like to read? Oh, goodness. 
Um, you know, I have to say that I'm always either doing research or reviewing. And so the contemporary novelists that I read um, are generally ones that I'm reviewing. Um, I reviewed Gary Steingart's new book, uh, and I thought it was hilarious, and I enjoyed it. Um, I reviewed Lydia Davis's trans re new translation of Madame Bovary, and it's good enough that it is new. Um, I really, really thought it was great. And you know, <clears throat> even if you've read Madame Bovary in translation seven times, this is a good one. Um, I really enjoyed uh, the, the Slap, which is an Australian book that won the Commonwealth Prize and is up for the Booker. Um, wonderful book, and they sure are different in Australia than they are here. Um, so those are three that come to mind. You alluded earlier to the changing nature of publishing. Yeah. Do you have a crystal ball? No. Nope. What, what does it mean to, if, if you had been starting out at this point, uh -huh. and young, art, young authors at this point seem to be facing incredible pressure to do extremely well with their first books, if they're going to have a second yeah. book. So where do, you, where, do you think, where do you think we're headed, and what does it mean for young authors? Well, my, my daughter is a young author, and... Um, you know, I think her choice is to just keep at it and hope for the best. Um, to me, there will always be a market for narrative. Whether it's in the shape of a book, whether it will be published by a publishing company, I don't know. But is the appetite for lengthy narrative really going to go away? I don't think so. Janet Ivanovich just got $40 million for her next 10 books or whatever it was. I don't know how many it was. So obviously there's faith in her. Is there faith in the literary ones? Doesn't seem to be. Why is that? Don't know. So um, I've been thinking lately about, I, I love the Icelandic sagas, which are wonderful narratives. But sometime in the late 15th century, they stopped writing sagas, and they, and they began going to um, more poetry, song, folktale type thing. Why was that? Was it a technological thing? Was it just an exhaustion of taste about the sagas? I don't know. But, um, you know, I'm, I have faith that things come and go and that um, the novel is of too much interest to be superseded. You know, Henry James thought he had done away with Charles Dickens. Virginia Woolf thought she had done away with Henry James. You know, so, um, so maybe there are those out there thinking they're doing away with me. But only future generations will be able to say. I hope you're right. Thank you. Yeah. Can you tell us what the next Jane Smiley novel will be about? Well, I have two books coming out this month. One is the second volume. Does anybody have the Georges and the Jewels? Um, one is the second volume of this series of horse, girls' horse books. So uh, that the second volume is called A Good Horse. That'll be out at the end of the month. <coughs> and then I wrote a nonfiction book about the invention of the computer, which is way more interesting than you ever realize. It is full of characters, it is full of drama, it is full of kind of amazingly weird stuff happening, amazing coincidences. And um, it, it doesn't seem that it was inevitable at all that the computer as we know it was going to be um, invented. And it was a really interesting story, so that book is going to be out in the next couple of weeks also. Um, and after that, just wait and see. I think that's all. Thank you for having me. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.